in these conversations I've learned. So mm -hmm. um, we're live. Great. <laughs> hey, good morning, uh, uh, Dr. Chafee. Thank you very much. Uh, Rob Kiltz, we're sharing on, uh, let's see, Dr. Kiltz uh, YouTube and see my fertility YouTube. And hopefully it's going to be broadcast on Facebook uh, also. But I never know on these technical errors. Yesterday I came home, I had, I had alarms going off. I had nothing else. But uh, we're going to continue the conversations. And uh, I was uh, blessed to, have, to be interviewed by Dr. Chafee. And we're going to basically continue the conversation. And let's hear more about your side of things. And uh, plant-free MD, is that, is that, do I have the right handle? And I apologize yeah. if I don't. No, that's it. Yeah, Plant Free yeah, MD is, is uh, my podcast. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this mess of carnivore and and health and wellness. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm um, you know I'm I was born and raised in America, but uh, I played uh, rugby in the U.S. and on the you know I was an All American in high school and then traveled around um, as a, as a late teenager and an adult traveling, playing around the world, and absolutely loved it. Ended up going to medical school in Europe um, after I, I finished playing professionally over there, and um, always was interested in diet and nutrition just because of my interest in medicine and biology, but also because of a athletics. I always wanted to be able to, to eat the right thing to fuel my body so I could perform the best. And so I got into this in a, in a very strange way. I was taking cancer biology at the University of Washington in Seattle, and we were learning that that plants use poisons to defend themselves, which is actually something that I remember learning in seventh and eighth grade biology as well. You know, that plants and animals are in an evolutionary arms race, plants becoming more and more poisonous, so less and less animals can eat them so they can survive and thrive. And then animals becoming adapted to specific poisons and specific plants so they can eat that plant and, you know, nothing else can. So that's their dedicated food source. Um, that's, some, that's, that's something I, I remember quite clearly learning in, in uh, junior high uh, biology. And then we're sort of reiterating this in, in my, you know, upper vision level cancer biology class, but looking at it specifically from a cancer standpoint. So we were looking at all the different carcinogens that were in vegetables. And, and we learned, this is now 22 years ago uh, that I took this, they had already identified 136 known human carcinogens just in Brussels sprouts and over a hundred just in you know, white mushrooms and then spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, broccoli, you know, everything that we would find at a store, you know, they all had 60 or 80 or over a hundred known human carcinogens each. And they were quite abundant. We knew this from work from Dr. Uh, or Professor Bruce Ames from Berkeley in 1989, he published a large work showing that, you know, there are 10,000 times more naturally occurring poisons, insecticides, pesticides in plants and vegetables like spinach than the pesticides we spray on them by weight. So, um, you know, the natural insecticides out, outweighed the, the commercial insecticides and that the natural poisons were far more likely to cause cancer than the pesticides we sprayed on them. This is why we still have pesticides because they did this research. They were trying to ban all these things and they did the research and say, well, actually, you know, it's a drop in the bucket if you're actually going to eat the plant in the first place. So we were quite blown away by this. And, you know, I, I remember looking around just wildly. I was just like, I, I must be joking. I was looking around for like a TA who was like smirking in the corner or something like that, who was in on the joke, but there, there was no one. And, uh, and I just sort of dawned on me like, man, this guy's serious. And, but I still thought in my head, I was like, okay, but, but vegetables are still good for you though. Right. And he just must've, you know, read my mind because he just looked at us and he said, I don't need salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. So and I was like, right. How long, ago? how long ago was this? 22 years ago. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I heard that. I was just like, right, screw plants. I'm just, like, I'm just not going to eat those things. And, you know, I went to the store. I went shopping after that. And I was just looking around. And I was like, everything has a plant in it. Everything's plant-based. It's just everything. And I was just looking around. I was just like, plants, 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 you know, pasta, rice, you know, vegetables, obviously, you know, produce aisle. And I, I came around some eggs. I was like, okay, eggs, right? Eggs don't come from a plant. Fine. And meat, meat doesn't come from a plant. Okay. And milk, milk doesn't come from a plant. And I just ate eggs, meat, and milk for the next five years. And I was, you know, I was playing, uh, well, you know, 
the top grade rugby in the U.S. and at the collegiate level and the men's level played in the the you know the national you know the for you know the Super League in America, Division One America, and the Canadian Premiership as well. I you know, toured with the you know the junior national team down in New Zealand, um, and uh, you know I, and so I was, I was playing sports at a very high level. I was in I was at the University of Washington at the time. So you know I woke up in the morning, go to class. As soon as I was done with class, I was straight into uh, rugby training uh, with. Uh, my collegiate team. And then as soon as I was done with my collegiate team, I'd go to the men's team. And so I was just training, you know, for six, seven hours a day, uh, every day. And then I'd have two, three games on the weekend. I'd play as many games as I could. And, 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 you know, when I switched over to just, I stopped, you know, stop the plants, like my, my performance just went just, at, you know, into, into the stratosphere. You know, I stopped, I, I just couldn't get tired anymore. I couldn't run out of energy. I couldn't get sore anymore. I wasn't getting sore after working out. I don't get sore anymore after I work out. And that's something that I've, I've noticed is directly to do with different things we eat. Generally, like grains, carbs, beans, those will, those will really kick off, you know, the, the delayed onset uh, muscle soreness. Coffee, too. Coffee's a bean, though. So, you know, that's uh, it's going to have similar sort of things. And so I just, I just felt absolutely amazing. And then I was in England playing professionally. And I sort of started slipping off of it because you know some of the some of the meat was breaded. I couldn't I didn't really have the same access to meat that um, that I did in America. And a lot of people get mad at me you know in England. It's like, well, we have great meat in England. It's really good quality here. You just didn't go to the right butcher. And I'm like, okay, maybe where you live, but where I was, it, it really sucked. And like you know the, whatever it was, like it wouldn't cook right. I don't know if they like injected water into it or something like that. But I try to like cook it up and like grill it or fry it and it like it wouldn't brown it just would not brown it just turned oh. gray and sweaty and so i was just like i was like trying to get it brown on each side right. but it wouldn't brown it ended up being well done but still just gray and sweaty on the sides and just cooked all the way through i'm like well that's gross and so i just i, I could not cook these things properly and so you know i'm sure it was mostly to do with me but whatever it was i couldn't i couldn't do it and so I was getting meat that was like pre-cooked and sort of breaded. And I was like, ooh, is it going to make that big of a difference? And, and I was like, well, maybe it's just a little bit. So it's not that big of a deal. But, you know, I, I absolutely started. That was when I started noticing a difference in my performance and my health. From your team, when, like when you were on this carnivore lifestyle uh, doing rugby at an early age, it sounds like, uh, what yeah. did your teammates and other people think about that? Where were they thinking you're crazy? Were they interested? What was the mm. thoughts? Yeah, well, that, that was the thing. Like, it, you know, I, I never really thought of it as like a, a carnivore diet. I just, I just knew that I wasn't going to eat plants. And you know, my 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 best friend, um, you know, growing up, we we, we played rugby together. Uh, well, he got me into rugby. You know, I, I told him at the time, I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to eat any of these things. And that was when, you know, Atkins was sort of making a revival. And, and he was saying, like, oh, yeah, well, you know, a lot of people are, are ditching carbs anyway. So, you know, you, that, could, that could just roll into this. And, and so, you know, I, I just, you know, he knew that I was doing it, but I, I don't, he didn't really try it himself because I, you know, I didn't think of it as like, wow, this is making a big performance enhancement. I also stopped, you know, drinking during the season at that time, too. And I attributed a lot of this to just not drink. It was obviously has a huge uh, benefit. As well, I only drank once a week just after rugby games. We would go out and we'd have a big party, and and you know we drink. But then it would take like three, four days just to recover from that one night out, and I'd still be feeling it halfway through the week at training. And so you know that that obviously is going to to affect you quite significantly. And so when I stopped doing that, you know I was recovering the next day. I felt better, and so I thought, wow, that that's such a big difference. So it, it the timing was such that. Uh, I didn't realize how big of, a, of an effect dropping the plants had uh, on on my health. So I never really I never really brought it up that much. And you know, it's like now because I know what I'm doing. I'm doing a carnivore diet, and I don't eat for these sorts of reasons. It, it just comes up more. I don't know why. But at the, but back then, you know, I did this for five years, and and like no one said a thing ever. You know, it's just like it's like oh yeah, no, I'm just eating this. I just never said anything. I just I just ate what I ate, and then people just left me alone. It was yeah. So were you were you conscious of it back then in the sense of what you're teaching and sharing today? You know, what what got you to finally get the, the bulb went off and, and, and say, OK, I'm going to focus on this and I want to teach this in a way that I can help 
my my fellow humans uh, improve their lives. Yeah, well, it, it's yeah, well, it's sort of it sort of was a buildup over the next you know twenty years of my my undergraduate education, my own personal research, and then you know in medical school and beyond. Uh, you know, you know the different discoveries come out. You know, with Dr. Uh, Robert Lustig out of UCSF, with you know his work on fructose and showing that this was this was this had more was more likely to be involved in heart disease than just than just fat and cholesterol. Then all the information coming out about how the you know cholesterol model of of uh, heart disease was was not only wrong but fraudulent and. Uh, and a lot of other things that just came out as uh, as well. And then just obviously, you know, we've been taught since we were kids that humans are apex predators, top of the food chain. You know, apex predators don't graze. You know, li you know, lions don't eat grass, and and dolphins don't eat kelp to get roughage. You know, and so you know, when you're top of the food chain, you eat animals. And then I came across uh, Dr. Baker on on the Joe Rogan podcast, um, and that. You know, watching him for five minutes, I was like, you know, th this guy is more right than he knows. And just everything just clicked in because all the different things that I knew about, you know, plants being toxic, um, you know, you know, fructose actually being a, a big player in, in uh, metabolic disease and, and, and cholesterol just not actually being a problem, you know, that that fed in with everything that he was talking about on Joe Rogan's podcast. And so I was just like, OK, yeah, th this makes sense. And when I started looking at medicine. Uh, from that step, from that perspective of, you know, humans are animals and the kind of animal that we are, are carnivores. And we're carnivores that are not living and eating as carnivores. And so we're getting diseases from that. Like if you were feeding, uh, you know, grains, a lot of grains to a bear or a wolf or a dog or a cat, you know, they're going to get fat. They're going to get diabetes. They're going to get autoimmune diseases. You know, and same as, you know, any sort of zoo animal, you know, you talk to any zookeeper who knows that who's worth their salt, you know, they'll tell you, you feed an animal something that it doesn't eat in the wild, something it didn't evolve on, it gets sick. What does it get sick with? It's obesity, heart disease, liver disease, diabetes, cancer, autoimmune diseases, arthritis, all, all the same things that we get, all the same things that dogs and cats get when given kibble as opposed to meat, which is what they're supposed to eat. And so when I just started looking at that, at, at, at human medicine from that perspective, things just started slotting into place. And it just everything just started making a lot more sense. And so I, I really just started, you know, just really digging into the research and started just trying to just to to read as much as I could and see, okay, what do we know? What what can we prove? What can we you know what have we discovered? What you know remains to be discovered? And I just started finding, you know, more and more obviously found all the you know, the, the, the pioneers, such as, you know, Dr. Sa you know, J.H. Salisbury and uh, Stephanson and, um, oh, and oh, what's his name? He wrote uh, The Stone Age Diet in 1975. As recently as 1975, you know, doctors were, were, were publishing these things. Well, and, uh, you know, so. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like we're, we're, we're running into it, and, but how did we not see it before? But I'm still mm -hmm. amazed that the doctor, the, the professor that taught you that plants were poisonous, and you were able to see that. I'm assuming that was in college, uh, yeah. uh, not too long ago, right? In, in all yeah. of this. So, what's your biggest? What do you think is the is the biggest roadblock and barrier to um, uh, the sharing of this story and getting people to believe it? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just just the, you know the the inertia that's behind. Uh, you know, meat being bad for you, meat causing cancer, cholesterol, and saturated fat, causing heart disease and diabetes and obesity. Uh, you know, there's a lot behind this, and, and there's a lot of money behind it as well. There's been a lot of you know ads and propaganda um, that have just come out over the last well, really like 60 years or plus, and and so it's difficult because now everyone knows it. You know, once everyone knows it, you know, it's 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 hard to sort of you know go against that. And, you know, I, I talk to people as well and they and, you know, they go on a carnivore diet and they reverse their diabetes. They come off their medications. They come off their high blood pressure medications. And uh, I was just talking to, uh, you know, someone um, that was helping out on, on uh, you know, social media today. And he said he went to his endocrinologist and, and he, he, his HbA1c went from 9.3 down to 6.1 uh, since December. Right. And and his endocrinologist was like, wow, you haven't really seen this. And he said, you know, how, and, and but she was just like, yeah, no, but you, you can't eat red meat. Red, red meat's really bad for you. You need, you need to stop eating red meat, you know, and you need to stop eating you know, high fat and this that, and the other. And he just asked her, he's like, 
you know, but you know, have you ever seen someone reverse diabetes? And she said, no, I've never seen that. It doesn't happen. And he's like, okay, but I've just done it. You've just seen the results. So why are you telling me to stop doing what got me these results? You know, and she just, just, just you know, and, and you're saying, you're saying that red meat's bad for me, but I'm getting good results. So like, what's the evidence to say that red meat's bad for me? Like, why are, you know, what, what's, what's behind that? And she just like dismissed him and just said, you know, I, I just don't, we don't have time to talk about this. We have nutritionists if you want to talk to them, but you know, uh, you know, I, I don't have time to talk about this right now. So basically she didn't know what she was talking about. She was just, you know, uh, you know, speaking, um, you know, out, out of nowhere and, um, and, and wasn't able to back it up and didn't, didn't, uh, feel like admitting that, you know, and that's uh, unfortunately a problem with, with doctors, a lot of doctors as well is that, you know, we regurgitate a lot of these things and because we're doctors, obviously it's correct, you know, but a lot of these things are just nonsense and we didn't learn it in, in medical school. I don't remember being taught that red meat causes cancer or any of these sorts of things in medical school. I don't remember being taught nearly anything about nutrition in medical school besides some you know, simple biochemistry sides of things. Um, but these are, these are just things that, that, that get, you know, we've had regurgitated to us in society for so long. And then when we go through medical school, we just go, oh yeah, yes, that's true. And I'm a doctor, but we didn't learn that in medical school. We weren't taught that in medical school. That was just something that everyone, everyone knows. And so it's, it's, it's a pervasive story that's there so often that you just yeah. believe it. And it's like political uh, politics, religion, and you know, everything in our culture is based on our belief systems. And, and, and so uh, science somehow, so, science is really snake oil like anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a marketing ploy. And so, how, what, how does it make you feel in sort of when, when, you know, you hear the story of the patient talking to the doctor and the doctor says, you know, you, you're, you're wrong and doesn't want to listen to it. And what are your thoughts and idea how we can all improve the sort of the, uh, uh, I guess the word, right word is uh, recruiting followers into, the, into this world in essence. You know, we're telling a story also, but, yeah. you know, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, and you know, I think it just you know plays into you know your previous question is 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 that we just we just have to educate people and we just have to show them the evidence and you know when I, I encourage people when they're talking to their doctor it's like well my cardiologist you know wants me to do X Y and Z um, what what can I do about it it's like well you know you ask them why and ask them what the evidence is for that you know it's like can you show me the evidence for that because you know I've been told by another doctor that there's evidence against it and here are the studies here's the evidence. You know, so what is your evidence? Can you show me that? And, you know, and, and, you know, you can do it nicely, but, you know, you, you can ask, you can ask for their, their evidence and, you know, if their evidence is better than my evidence, then, you know, go with it. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't mind that, but, um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I'm right. And, um, you know, and if, and if they have evidence that shows that I'm wrong, I'd love to see it because, you know, I, I want, I want to know what's going on. I don't actually have a you know, dog in the fight, but, you know, just educating people, and, and showing the actual real world results, um, it will just sort of make a grassroots movement and, and eventually more clinicians will have to start picking this up because you know, there are responsible clinicians out there. I've met many doctors that have seen, um, you know, have, have spoken to me and seen my results and, and listened to what I have to say and they've completely changed the way they approach uh, medicine and their own uh, nutrition and also who have had patients like my mom when she went to her doctor and she, her HbA1c went from 8.9 down to 6.6.1 .6 in two months on a carnivore diet. And and her doctor was like, "How the hell did you do this? What the hell did you do? You know, like you know, di type two diabetes is only a progressive disease. It only gets worse. You know, this does not go backwards. You know, we we can mitigate it and slow it down with diet, and lifestyle, and medications, but that's it. It only gets worse. But you 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 don't reverse it. Like, how the hell did you do this?" And you know, my mom told her what I was doing and what my research and, and sort of what I was uh, concluding. And she said, you know, I you know, I'd really like to take a look at his research. And you know, that, that's really interesting. You know, she's a, she's a very bright lady too. She was an MD PhD from Harvard, has a PhD in biochemistry from Harvard. And I had a long conversation with her talking about like I, I think we've got biochemistry all wrong. We're calling this a fed state and this is a fasting state. And I, I think that's completely off. I think this fasting state is our primary metabolic state. This is where all of our heavy machinery comes to bear. This is where all these things work better. And she's just sort of like, like, 
damn it, you know, that's right. And she, and she, you know, has, has completely changed her practice as well in, in, in its approach to diabetes as well. So, you know, it does, it does happen. And when you see these real results, you know, if, if you're a responsible open-minded clinician, like you have to, you have to take notice. And even if it goes against the doctrine, you know, because as, as Richard Feynman says, you know, it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is and it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. And so if you're saying, oh, you have to do, you, you have to use treatment X for diabetes is the best thing to do. And I do treatment Y and it just completely reverses it. You, you can't just go, no, 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 no. That's a fluke. X is the way to go. It's like, well, we've done this in real life and, and Y is the way to go. And I think people, you know, will continue to come around to that as long as, as long as just, you know, the information keeps getting out there and people keep having the results that they will. So keep sharing the story, encouraging people, which yeah. I, I know through social media, I mean, this is a community sourced uh, health and wellness care. It's a whole different game today that, you know, we spent a lot of money to go to medical school and, and then, and then our residency training, uh, you know, and, and you're, you're learning away. But now, uh, through your experience and so many other people's experiences, that's really so critical and amazing. And, uh, and here we are on, on let's see, Facebook, uh, 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 YouTube. I've got Instagram just running in the background for people that just happen to be there for whatever reason. But this is the new way. But there is that. That, that, that still, because of our background, uh, the science, you know, I think for those of us that go into medicine, it's who believe in science. There's a scientific answer to everything. And when for some reason something is opposite of the science, we're like, uh, we don't know what to do in this. And I know that I looked at it for so long and like, it didn't make sense uh, until it did. And it's yeah. kind of what you're saying. Let's see, we have Allison, Bev, Reno, Dex, Anna, and many others. Uh, and, and, and although this is partly in my world because of fertility, but I think it's in your world too. But uh, Re Reno and a couple others asked, uh, waiting for our live, does carnivore, uh, does carnivore decrease my fertility? Because I've seen a decrease in my libido and I'm trying for a baby. What, hmm. what, do you, what are no, your I thoughts? Wouldn't, that? I wouldn't think I, so. I, I, I'm the opposite in that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Well, I've, I've, I've often seen the opposite. In fact, that was that was why the, the Seventh Day Adventists originally tried to get people to stop eating meat was because they wanted to lower your libido, and they knew that eating meat raised your libido or at least kept it healthy. Um, no, I've, I've, I've absolutely seen the opposite. So I, I would wonder, you know, if they're pure carnivore or if they're eating something else as well, or if there's something else uh, going on in the mix, because, you know, I was just, I was just talking to that, you know, that gentleman I was speaking to before we spoke to his endocrinologist, you know, he's been doing carnivore, uh, since December and he, he increased his testosterone from 340 up to 450, you know, in, in a few months. So, you know, I mean, this is, this is going to optimize your hormones for both men and women and, and optimize your, uh, fertility as well. I would say. You know, it's it's interesting. I was I, I was looking up uh, abortifications and uh, and menagogs, mm. and and it's it's um, you know I just looking at all stuff and basically the 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 world knew how to make people infertile and knew how to create miscarriages and abortions and it, as you, it's all plant based science and and the mm. uh, and and so men's libido got got, got challenged, but also there are some plants that actually add estrogen and progesterone and testosterones that, that you know it may make some people because herbal medicines, right? I mean, that's what the last number of thousands of years we've always been in, in, in looking for a, a, an herbal medicine to fix things or to kill our neighbors or ourselves or, or some ploy and play of, of, of that. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, although let me ask a couple questions. What got you into medicine uh, and, and where you're at? And one other question came about, is your girlfriend a carnivore? Yeah, yeah, she is. Yeah, I mean, obviously she's a, she's a convert um, and she started eating you know, more meat when she when we started dating. And obviously, you know, I was, that's what that's what I'm cooking anyway. And like because I've been you know, I, I know how to cook the hell out of a steak now. So like they're, you know, they're amazing. So, you know, every time she would come over, obviously she wanted to to cook what I you know eat, what I was eating. 
And, and so she would just eat a lot more meat that way and then would ask questions and so we'd get more interested. But she was still eating other things. And then we sort of, you know, sort of made a deal with her as I was like, okay, well, why don't you just try it like full on, you know, for a while and see how you go. And she did it just as, as sort of like, you know, on, on like a challenge sort of thing. But then after, you know, a couple of months of being on it and, and how much better she felt and then when she sort of slipped off of it every now and then and she could see like how much worse she felt and she felt like gross and sick the rest of the day when she just had, a, you know, a few bites of a, of a pancake with pancakes with some like frosting and, and uh, um, uh, you know, syrup on it. And she was just like, yeah, that's gross. I just felt awful. And and so then she's act, now she's actually seen the contrast and how much better she feels now. So now she's, yeah, she's full on it. Uh, of her own volition, which is great. Um, as far as how I got into medicine, you know, I, I was just, you know, I was, I was one of those ones like in the classic uh, med school application. I actually wanted to be a doctor since I was a little kid. That was, that was one of the things that, um, you know, that, that sometimes people say on their application is it's complete garbage, but I actually did. I, you know, I remember one of, one of my earliest memories of being at my grandmother's house and, and just thinking like, I just, I want to know how the human body works like down to the molecular level. I just want to know, I just want to know everything about it. I want to know exactly how it works and, and how to fix it. And I always thought about, you know, just surgery, just being just most, you know, just, just so incredible, you know, being able to like, you know, you know open someone up and, and fix them, go inside of them and physically fix them with your hands is just the most incredible thing that I could think of. And so that was, that was always just something I was very fascinated by. And, you know, as I grew up, all of my favorite classes were math and sciences and and those are really the only the main things that i liked taking and so it just it just made sense it was like okay well this was sort of a, a childhood uh you know fantasy but at the same time this is this is sort of the direction my life's taking anyway so you know we'll just keep keep rolling with it and uh you know and i'm, I'm very glad it did because i have i absolutely love the profession i love being able to help people i love i love seeing pain i love doing surgery absolutely love it and you, know, you as a surgeon you know, like if you don't, uh, if you don't love it, you don't want to you know, just you don't, don't do it, you know, but like generally people who do it really do love it and are very passionate about it. So it is something that I really enjoy doing. And um, yeah, and then and then just having this added, uh, you know, added added bonus of actually knowing how the body works, pretty much down to molecular level, at least from this, from this point of view. Uh, has has just been incredible, man. Being able to to heal people and see them just reverse so many medical issues, and and just heal themselves without just just tons of medications and surgeries that it, that uh, are are just unnecessary, honestly. And uh, that has been a great uh, great boon to my to my practice is um, just being able to fix people and, and get to the root cause of their problems as opposed to just you know sticking band aids on things. So you're in residency in neuro. What are you in residency for? Remind us again. Neurosurgery. Neurosurgery. And and how do you interact with your patients in the discussion of of uh, the, the the changes in our nutrition? Yeah. So you know, it, it, yeah, it depends. You know, sometimes it, it, you know it's not going to come up. Um, but uh, you know, when people are having you know you know serious you know pain, back pain, and radiculopathy, you know, from from pinched nerve or, or uh, you know canal stenosis. You know, I, obviously, that's that's something that, that in some instances can be fixed surgically. Sometimes they can't, and sometimes you decompress uh, their nerves or, or open up their canal, and their pain doesn't go away. You know, either because it's been compressed for so long that the nerves have had permanent damage, uh, or, or some other reason. But you know, sometimes you get you you exhaust your your surgical, uh, you know. Uh, your surgical possibilities. And so you just basically refer them on a chronic pain and just be like, Ooh, sorry about that. And they're just, you know, getting, you know, drugs and injections and, and support groups. And so for those, you know, I just sort of mentioned like, Hey, look, you know, this is something that you, if you, you know, the, the different foods that you eat can cause a lot of inflammation in your body and that can actually exacerbate pain. This is something I've, I've noticed personally myself. And so, you know, this, this can actually really help, especially carbohydrates, grains, uh, you know, seeds, rice, all these things, beans, you know, it makes a big difference. And, and I've even spoken to people because, you know, it, you know, it's, it's a, there's a public and a private system here in Australia and the public system, it can actually be four and a half years before someone can get from their referring doctor to see us in an outpatient setting for, yeah. So it's, 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 you know, when you look at the, when you see like the delays and, you know, like Bernie Sanders and, um, and, uh, 
oh, who was it? The guy from um, Ted Cruz, you know, they had a debate on the healthcare systems, you know, several years ago. I really wish I was there in the audience because like I'd worked in, in both systems and I could have, I could have really actually blown that discussion up. But, you know, one of the things they were saying, they were like, well, you know, on average, you know, um, on average, it takes, you know, 56 days or something like that in, in Europe to get surgery. Um, and, uh, and here it's only, you know, like seven days or something or five days. And, uh, you know, someone came up and, and said, oh, I'm from the Netherlands. And my mother, you know, got diagnosed with cancer. And she got, you know, surgery right away. And you know, she got surgery like two days afterwards and stuff like that. What they don't tell you is that those 56 days uh, are from when that you've seen the surgeon, you've seen the specialist say, yes, you need surgery. And so, you know, we'll schedule you for surgery. This concludes all like the little surgeries for like, you know, taking, taking off a mole and things like that as well. Um, but they don't tell you that it took you four and a half years to get in to see the guy in the first place. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that's how it is here. So it's, it's four and a half year waiting list to get in to see us, uh, to get assessed for spinal surgery. And then it might be a couple months, a couple months, a couple months. And then we say, okay, you know, trying conservative management and different sorts of treatments. And then we say, okay, no, you need surgery. And it can be up to a year or more at that point, you know? And so, and, and that, you know, the guy uh, from like the Netherlands or whatever, you know, he said, oh, my, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. She had surgery two days later. Guarantee you that it she was waiting for years and years and years to see a specialist, didn't get into him. And it got to the point of criticality. And she went into the emergency department. And this was now a critical life-threatening emergency. They had this and go, okay, we need to take this out or she's going to die. The emergency system works quite well. Someone comes in in that situation and they're going to die. They get surgery quite quickly. Um, you know, about 60% of our, of our patients come in that way you know, with, with brain tumors and things like that. And that, and that's, that's generally how that presents anyway, because these things grow quite quickly and all of a sudden you just get smacked with, with symptoms. But yeah, that's, that's, um, that's, uh, you know, behind the scenes thing they don't tell you, but yeah, so, so four and a half years, these guys are waiting and wow. then, you know, like three months to get an MRI and then another, you know, and then try to get you know, nerve root sleeve injections for another three months and then doing this, all these sorts of things. And so these guys are in pain the whole time. And so, you know, if, if, if they seem amenable to it, you know, I'll, I'll pepper that in as well. It's like, Hey, this is something you can do as well. And this can help with your pain. And some of them try it and some of them don't, but, uh, basically all the ones that have tried it, I come back and see them in three months and like, my pain's gone, you know? And so it's, it's a big one for that, especially for the chronic pain things, especially for the guys who have had surgery and have had lingering symptoms and pain uh, after that you know i find that they they respond very well uh, to what's, dietary. what's your best explanation to the the molecular physiologic things that are happening inside the body that are reducing the 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 pain and, and the symptoms that people are having yeah that's a good question i you know i, I don't know you know down to the you know you know the, the exact detail but you know you know, even just looking at these things from a, you know, delayed onset muscle soreness, you know, when you, when you work out, generally people get sore the day after, two days after, you know, I don't anymore. I'm sure you don't either, you know, that, but if I drink a cup of coffee, I'm sore for two days. You know, if I have a bit of rice or, or beans or whatever, if it's like mixed into my meat, even if I'm not like eating a bite of rice, you know, I'll be horribly sore for a couple of days. So, so there, there are inflammatory factors in, in these plants that are just going to latch on to this nidus of healing tissue or something that's something that's off. And it's just going to increase that, that uh, inflammation in that area. And you're going to increase your, your pain response. So if you have a damaged nerve or you, if you have healing muscle tissue or, or even a sunburn, you know, I, I, you know, if I get very red in the sun, it doesn't hurt and I can take a hot shower. It's fine. But you know, otherwise, you know, before I was eating, it, it would be very painful. And so, you know, this is going to latch on to, you know, healing areas of, of tissue and it's just going to increase the inflammation and damage and pain. And so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what the mechanism is, but I, I have recognized it as being there just, just from, from my own experience with myself and with, with patients. It's kind of like a car, or plane, or whatever you're using in life. You don't have to know how it works or why it works. Yeah. You just know that the story is it works. And I think yeah. that's why so many scientists are so, uh, and doctors, they just well, like, it, it doesn't make sense, or we need to see the scientific reason why. 
and then I'll believe it rather than, yeah. it, it, you know, it's it somehow this is this is the holy grail. If, if you think about it for for health and wellness is is a, you know, a, a, a proper human diet, as Ken uh, Berry likes to, to use the, the term, uh, is is really a carnivore. Although I was thinking about yeah. keto, carnivore, Atkins, paleo, uh, no matter what words we use, it's still a label that's hard for people to understand what it really is. Because, you know, I do carnivore, but uh, for me, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm 66. I have I mean, I've got problems, but physically really very little. Uh, but from time to time, I will eat. I did have an avocado yesterday, which was very unusual. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I occasionally eat French fries, dipped in mayonnaise, and, and, and I will rarely drink uh, a little bit of wine. Or, 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 or and coffee is a thing that I probably drink more than, than anything else, which I know what it is. But I mm -hmm. add butter, and personally... Uh, I enjoy it. I've been off of it for a year. I went off of it for six months last year. And, and so we each have to find the thing, but it's the labels. And so really, because I, I know when I ask someone, well, what did you eat? They usually go into what they're not eating or they're eating healthy. And, and so it's a hard thing for people to really give the, 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 the things. How do you address that? Now, again, we talked about carnivore and someone trying to get pregnant, but mm -hmm. what does carnivore really even mean? What does it mean to you? Yeah. Well, that, yeah, I mean, that, I, I think that um, as much as, as what not to eat, as what, what to eat, obviously, you know, carnivore, you're just eating meat. And that, and, you know, but um, I think that's pretty simple. And just sort of like the Constitution of the United States, you know, is like these are the enumerated powers of, of the government. They don't get to do anything else. Like anything else is just, F off. Right. But, you know, but then people say, oh, no, no, no. But we should say, what well, you know, and it sort of gets a bit confusing. But uh, no, anything that's not in here, they can't do that. That's sort of what it is. And so anything that's not meat or water, you can't do. So but it, it but to just put more of a stress on it, I just I just say, you know, think about what not to eat as well, because you're, you're, you know, meat is what you want to eat. That's what gives your nutrition. That's what's going to give you uh, everything that you need. But, you know, the, you don't want, the trick is not eating the other things because it's not just that they're not as good for you or you don't have to eat them. It's that you don't want to eat them because they're harmful. So, you know, my hard rule is no plants, no sugar, nothing artificial. And that would go for sauces, seasonings, and drinks as well. And I would include, you know, plants and fungi as well. So it's not just, just plants. So anything, anything that grows it from the ground, I wouldn't eat. And, um, and so that, that's, that's how I think about it. And so I don't use any seasonings. I don't really use sauces. You know, I just drink water, uh, and, and just eat meat. I salt to taste and, and that's pretty much it. And I, I do notice that, you know, if, if there would be some pepper on something or, uh, maybe some, some seasonings would get on something. If I was at a, at a restaurant, it doesn't make, it's not the end of the world, you know, but it, like maybe in like 20, 30 minutes, I might get a bit of a stuffy nose or my face might get a little itchy or, or something like that. So it's, you know, it's enough to notice if it's just a little bit, but it, you know, it's enough to like, you know, bug me. And it's just like, well, I don't want that. And obviously if you keep doing that, it's going to build up and it's going to build up. And so, you know, it's, a, it's enough for me to notice and uh, notice that I don't want it. So it's, it's more reaffirming. Uh, for me that uh, I just I just want to stay away from these things. And also you're making me sore, right? If you're if you're an animal in the wild and you're running around and you just feel awesome all the time and you eat some plant and then you're just store, sore and stiff and achy, you know, for the next two days, you're like, well, screw that. I'm not eating that plant again. And that's exactly what the plant, you know, wants. It just wants to deter you. You know, that's its way of telling you to go away. Don't eat me, you know? And so fine, I, I'm happy to listen to that. It, it wants to make you fertilizer uh, or it basically plants are the predators. They want to control us. Mm -hmm. We forget that plants are live organisms and ultimately their DNA yeah. has been around for millions of years, probably longer than us. And so mm -hmm. we somehow think, well, we're the, you know, it's sort of like eating spiders or, or snakes or alligators, right? You know, if, if, you know, it's like go out and capture an alligator to bring home and eat like, you know, all power to you, but, you know, you might end up to be the food as much as anything else. And plants are no different. And uh, these are really some interesting things. And uh, uh, a Dex, uh, carnivore is more sensitive or react faster to non-carnivore foods, which essentially, you know, it's, it's if you're, you know, sort of the strictness of a lion, 
uh, if, if, if lions are actually really strict, because I know I've seen dogs and cats, you know, munch on, on uh, grass or bears on berries from time to time. But, but ultimately, uh, and I know for myself, uh, there are certain things that will cause me to have side effects uh, other than more than other things. And so I just sort of be really narrow 99% of the time. Uh, but, you know, you got to find out where are you at in this journey and what are you trying to prove for yourself individually? Because, you know, we're only giving information that we have found really valuable. But I, I can't remember who I was listening to. It might have been Sarah Holberg, which talks about um, giving an EpiPen to someone eating peanuts that might be allergic uh, or, or, or kale and insulin, ultimately, do those things really make sense in our, in our, in our modern uh, world anymore? Yeah. Well, yeah, true. And I mean, like, you know, that, that, that obviously, you know, if you need an EpiPen for something, you know, even a hundred years ago, yeah, you weren't going to make it, you know, and, uh, and, and, or needing insulin as well. You know, that's a very recent uh, development also, um, you know, that, yeah, the sensitivity, uh, you know, carnivores being a bit more sensitive to non-carnivore food. Yeah. I have noticed that. I think it's a combination of things. I think it's, it's, uh, you know, firstly, you, you're actually seeing the contrast now, you know, because when we're, when we're eating sort of plant things, we're eating a, you know, standard American diet, uh, we, we have all these toxins in our, in our bloodstream all the time. And so we just sort of feel we have this baseline level of crummy that we feel all the time. And so, you know, that, and we just call that normal and we sort of have and ups and downs. Drugs, and we take over the counter drugs yeah. or something in order to make us feel okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. And, and take stimulants like, you know, caffeine or, or whatever. And so, you know, we're doing that and we just sort of feel uh, sort of ups and downs as compared to that baseline level of, of crummy. And then when you get all this stuff out of your system and you feel exactly how amazing that you should feel all the time, which is shockingly better than I ever thought possible. You know, I don't feel a little better or a lot better. You know, I feel a thousand times better than I've ever felt in my entire life, even as a professional athlete eating a standard diet and mostly meat diet with like, you know, not that many carbs and, and certainly not a lot of sugar. And I wasn't drinking during the rugby season, even when I had fallen off of carnivore. So it, it, it makes a massive, massive difference. And, and, you know, seeing that contrast is, is very eye opening because then you sort of, you, you bring something back in. I remember I would sample something, something would slip in and be like, okay, well, let's just see how it makes me feel. And it would be a very big difference. And I'd be like, wow, I can actually see this. It just drops me down a lot. And you no, know, I don't feel as bad as I remember feeling two years earlier, even on a normal day, but it's a big drop from, from where I now feel. And so that's, you know, I can see that contrast and I don't like it, but also, you know, with any sort of poison, your body builds up a tolerance and a resistance, you know, just like alcohol. And it takes more alcohol to get drunk if you, you know, drink regularly. But and it's so still you, damage, right? 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 even though you right. might, it's, you, you might feel okay, but it's still right. doing yeah. damage. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and so you, you're building up a sort of, yeah, a bit of a tolerance. And so, uh, but yeah, you, you may not notice it as much, but, uh, yeah, of course, yeah, it's absolutely damaging you. And so, you know, you're bringing this stuff in, if you're eating it regularly, your body's sort of just getting used to that, that crummy feeling and you can sort of, you know, uh, tolerate that a bit more. And then when you get rid of it for a while, then your body's not used to it anymore. And then you reintroduce it and you get you know, smacked in the face with it. So I think, I think that's why I don't think that there's any sort of, you know, weird allergic, you know, sensitivities that, you know, people that go carnivore have, I think it's just a combination of, of seeing that contrast and also just being away from that, uh, well, uh, you know, stimulus anymore. Right. Less exposure to the things that actually are the antigenic components of inflammation but the most yeah. important part is the the fat the fat protects mm -hmm. the glycobiome when you eat real animal fat and technically we likely ate raw animal fat a lot for thousands if not millions of years and so but we are capable of eating see i would say the fruits the fresh fruit very limited times a year we likely did eat but it was limited and, yeah. and we didn't eat it all year round. And we likely didn't eat the seeds that mm. much. We ate the actual fruit, the sugar, which is interesting because my belief is that simple sugar from time to time is not as harmful as people think. 
but because most of our standard diets are high in plants, you know, it's what I, when, like we can go all the way over here. Hey, I only eat animal products or all the way over here. I only eat plant products, but technically there likely is a mystery in between unless you there's an allergic component that you don't even know about in what you're eating. But I would say the seeds and nuts are probably the, the deadliest things that we do. Yeah. And I, you know, I've had a number of friends died of cancer and yet they were labeled as healthy. They were lean and strong and they were younger. But but I would say it, it absolutely is the deadliest, deadliest thing of any frequency is eat seeds and nuts. What's your thoughts on fiber? Fiber. Yeah. So I, I, I think that um, uh, fiber is absolutely, you know, uh, not something that we need. I, there's, there's there's zero uh, hard evidence to show that there's any benefit of, of uh, fiber in the diet. But also there are studies that actually show quite strongly that this causes colon disease. So there was a, there's a study that showed uh, the only um, association between you know something that we were doing and increase and increased risk of diverticulosis were um, more fiber that you ate and the more number of bowel motions that you had so more times you were using your bowels and the more fiber that you're eating the both generally coincide those are the only things and they had actually had a strong association with development Paul, of Paul mason has done a nice talk on this i know that mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, you know, fiber menace is really a good one out there. But uh, so what you're saying is, is that actually fiber uh, causes cancer most yeah. likely? Well, it certainly, certainly causes harm and it causes, you know, it's been shown to cause micro abrasions in the gut lining, you know, and, uh, and damage, uh, you know, uh, the glycobiome, like you were saying as well, and scrape that right off. And, um, and it causes increased uh, you know, immune response as well. And because you're, you're overworking your colon as well, you're just causing it to move and to move and to move and to move and to move. Eventually it fails. And that, I think that's what diverticulosis is. It's the failure of that, of that muscle of the colon. You know, just like heart failure, you're just working, you're pumping against a high pressure gradient for too long and the muscle just wears out and you go into heart failure. You know, I think of diverticulosis as colon failure. You're just you're working it too much, too much, too much, and then it just starts to fail. Well, well, I always, you know, this is 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 one of a really great, great uh, where where most people don't again back to the glycans. Mm -hmm. Those are the protective mucinous layer of every layer of our body, every cell of our body, and so when we damage this layer, it it now allows the microbes, the lectins, oxalates, phytates. Sally Norton and others have talked about this and. And uh, you talked, I think, about uh, spinach and kale and lettuce earlier. But but basically, these things all have the damaging components. Interesting enough, the tomato plant, the leaves are toxic fast, but the tomato is not. And 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 a deck is bringing the point that that uh, you know the fruit and everything we eat today is nothing what it used to be for yeah. sure, no yeah. doubt about it. Uh, but 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 you know it's it it is still you know again in our carnivore side we have to be a little cautious of like it's it's all this or nothing because mm -hmm. that's where we're going to lose the world on and now you have to recognize how do we teach the science of this mm -hmm. which is really critical I mean yeah. what does the liver do with sugar uh, you know what does it do with sugar. And, and my, my bet is simple sugar is not the disease causer. It's the complex stuff, but it's still back to the, the how many meals a day, how many meals a week did we eat a million years ago? Yeah, yeah. I, no, I, no, mean, no. It, I mean, if you and I had to go hunting or go, you know, uh, hunt and gather, we'd be in trouble. I mean, you might be very good at hunting. I know mm. that uh, uh, Keto Savage and many others uh, Maria Emmerich loves to hunt with the bow and arrow and things like that. But, you know, I, I simply, you know, Google Snake River Farms and they deliver the most amazing steak <laughs> and, and Hudson Farms, the frog and, the, and all this other stuff. But it's really, really radical in this. How do we continue? And, and I, this is, I guess, uh, how do you, what's your sort of future dream of your mission in this, in this, uh, 
health and wellness since you're you are an MD and and uh, how do you you see yourself playing out the future of health and wellness? Well, I, you know, I, I certainly want to obviously continue in neurosurgery, but incorporating that, you know, in that practice, I actually just met uh, a couple from um, uh, Queensland who's a you know, um, gentleman's a, a neurosurgeon there and he has a, a practice in, you know, spinal surgery mostly, and they have a, a rehab sort of gym CrossFit gym sort of rehab thing as well. And they, they do carnivore as well. And they try to incorporate, uh, you know, at least ketogenic, you know, high fat meat based ketogenic diet and even carnivore diet into the recovery of their patients as well. So that's something that I, that I would definitely want to do. You know, what, you know, there, there are some, you know, indications for surgery that they just, some people just need surgery and, um, but you can, you can include and incorporate, diet and lifestyle modifications as well to optimize those or, or maybe even, uh, uh, you know, stop them from needing surgery in the first place. I would much rather heal somebody and get them back on their feet without having, without doing surgery on them. Even if that, you know, that makes, you know, that doesn't make me as much money. And, it, and obviously, you know, when you're doing procedures and you're doing surgeries, you know, that pays a lot more than office visits, you know, I mean, by orders of magnitude, you know, and so it's, uh, but that, that's totally fine with me. And so, you know, I have my, uh, my good friend, who's my my roommate in medical school, he uh, he ended up going into interventional radiology, uh, did his residency at Yale, uh, but now he's sort of starting one of these integrated healthcare practices, trying to you know getting gyms and coaches and all these sorts of things involved in sort of a you know holistic you know uh, health approach uh, down in Reno, and so you know uh, you know something like that as well, something that I would like to do, um, and even even in the in the in the cancer space, you know, with brain tumors and things like that, you know, people like Thomas Seafried, uh, you know, he's doing, he's doing studies with, uh, you know, GBMs in mice and just a ketogenic diet, um, you know, is actually showing very good results with that. So I think that's, that's very, very important as well, especially for cancer patients uh, to, to certainly address uh, these sorts of things. I, I think, I think it's, it's a bit unethical to not bring these things up when patients ask me, is there something else I can do? What can I do to help with this? And I, I just, even though it's not, you know, I have to tell them, I like, look, this is not the, the, the department's guidelines. These are not the, the neurosurgical department here, uh, you know, uh, you know, guidelines or, or suggestions. This is, this is my own personal uh, recommendation from my own research. And I'm, you know, and just, so just take that for what it is and I have to give you resources to look at and then you, you make your own decision. But I don't think it's ethical to not bring these things up and not to, not to tell people about that because, they, they, you know, I've seen it help significantly. Well, you're down under and I know I've been reported to my medical board. I've been reported to the medical school, yeah. told them not talk about this. And I've interviewed Gary Fetke and, and uh, I, I know and I think Finney. Uh, in in uh, South Africa, I think it was. So I was also taken to to, to uh, task about sharing this. Um, have you had anyone on your in your uh, 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 medical profession say anything, or what? Your are you, do you have a little bit of fear in this? Yeah. So you know, I am uh, you know conscious of that, and and the medical board here uh, is you know is you know does keep a very close eye on things. And so, you know, you, you do have to watch your step with them because, you know, they'll, if they, if they think that you're doing something that's endangering uh, patients, like they will be, they will be on down on you like a ton of bricks, which is totally fair. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy for that, but uh, you know, and, and because of that, you know, I, I do things in a very careful way. And I talk about these things in a very specific way saying, look, this, these are not the official guidelines. This is not the official recommendations. This is my personal things, but it's based in, in science. Here are the studies. Here's the research. Here are the groups uh, using this as a treatment method around the world. You know, here are their results, and you know, you take a look at it and you do what you want to do. And um, so it's been it's been fine from that standpoint. You know, the, the people in my department uh, have actually been very interested in in my approach to diet and lifestyle. And have, have, a lot of them have come up to me and talked to me and asked me about these things. A lot of, and several of them have taken up a carnivore diet as a result of this. And you know, I've spoken to them about you know uh, Dr. Seafried's work as well. I was like, you know, we should we should get like a trial going with our GBM patients, and you know, and and see if we could do something. And, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get you know a bit of, of interest in that. I'm hoping 
we can get like an actual trial going to see, you know, maybe, you know, get some of these people on like at least a high fat ketogenic diet or, you know, even better, a, a carnivore diet and see how these, how these people do, you know, after a surgery, uh, you know, just getting, getting some of these people on that and, and see how they do. So I've, you know, I've, 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 I've been okay in my department, but I have actually seen that. Um, when I was, when I first came down here, I was, I was, um, helping out with, um, on a general surgery rotation. And, um, and so I, I was talking to this patient about, you know, they wanted to, um, they were in under gastroenterology and gastroenterology asked us to consult, uh, for, for surgery. This patient had Crohn's. It wasn't, wasn't responding to medications properly. And so they, they wanted us to consider, uh, surgery to start chopping out chunks of bowel. And so I went and was, was assessing her for that and talking to her about it. And she was just saying, she's like, I really don't want surgery. Like, I was just like, it's just, you know, it's just going to be surgery after surgery after surgery. Like, I, I really wish I didn't have to do this. And I was just like, well, you know, there, there actually, you know, is, is data and information out there showing that things like an elemental diet actually, you know, re, you know, can get people into remission better than steroids and keep people in remission much longer uh, than, than all these different, you know, steroids and, and, uh, and, and, uh, you know, new agents. So, you know, if, if you wanted to approach this that way, you could try these different dietary changes and see how that goes with you. And you can always do surgery. Surgery. It's not like, you know, you, you don't get surgery now. Like you're just not, you're out of the club. You don't get to come back. You know, if you do this, if, and it doesn't work, you don't like it or, you know, whatever, you can always come back. We can always do surgery later. And they were really interested in that. And they asked me and I said, look, here are the research, here's the research, here are the studies, here are the papers, here are some resources, take a look at it. You know, let me know what you decide. You know, some little sniveling punk was like listening outside of the curtains on the gastro uh, team. And he overheard this. And instead of like talking to me and like, because I was, I was, I was, I was giving her, you know, paper after paper. I was like, look at this paper, look at this paper, look at this paper. Here's a talk by this person. Here's a, here's a lecture by this person. You, know, you look at these sorts of things. And, you know, instead of like asking me like, Oh, Hey, you know, what, what are those papers? What are those things? Whatever. He just went and like told his boss. And again, instead of, you know, actually, you know, speaking to me like an adult, he went to, you know, the head of my department and was just like, like, Oh, we're going to report this guy to the medical board. You know, it's just like, you haven't even checked to see if what I was saying was true. You know, sure, first, ask questions later. Yeah, uh, exactly. it's, it's, it's the it's the method of medicine. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and but I'm always I, I'm always suspicious, even on our side. Let's prove it. Let's write the paper. Let's get the money to support it. But ultimately, a lot of these things are about a product or, or a pill yeah. uh, or a keto supplement or something. When when ultimately, I think what we're saying here is simply going to a high meat zero plant-based diet is actually the healthiest thing someone could do to cure their current problem. I, 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 we got to be careful about even the promises we make in this, in this world of, you know, it, it's something that's going to help. And I know for myself, I herniated this 15 years ago. I went right to the surgeon. I said, can you fix this right now? Now, my guy said, you know what? Let's just wait. Okay. And thankfully he did that. But I would tell you that uh, because I went from there, I went paleo, then keto, then carnivore, never a back problem, never a hernia, nothing again. It's been, uh, been amazing. And I don't do any special exercises or anything. And I still do some light lifting and things like that. But, you know, I, I, I think that this is amazing. But the, the doctor that told me not to talk about it was diabetic, missing some legs. He then asked me, uh, can you tell me about this 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 dietary yeah. change? So, you know, I think ultimately because there's such pressure on all of us in our in our you know in our natural communities uh, mm. on, on how do we what do we follow what do we lead with and how do we learn and teach us in a way that that really is is game changing. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about what uh, uh, publications or books you're working on and mm. and uh, and. You know, so we can look forward to more of uh, Dr. Chafee. Yeah. Uh, 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 zero, what's what's a uh, uh, zero plant MD or plant? Plant, what plant do you do? free. Yeah, plant, plant free MD. MD. Yeah. Tell us about yeah. your books or your writings. 
Yeah. So yeah. Well, I'm at the moment. I'm, I'm working on on a book. It you know it's been it's been a bit difficult to find the time for it just with you know uh, work and everything like that. Um, but it, you know it's basically making the argument, obviously, you know that that we are carnivores. A bit of my my story, you know, my lead up into it, and uh, but also just just making that argument and coming at it from different different angles. And you know, like you say, you know, like how, how do we how do we you know fight against this inertia of the last fifty years? And so that that's sort of what I, I try to do uh, with this book. It's like saying, oh no, look here, look, you know, cholesterol was never was never a real thing. Like showing the history of that, showing the fraud behind it, showing the actual data and 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 what we we know. Um, looking at uh, you know plants and how toxic they are, and how we really don't want to eat them, how harmful they are. You know, the historical uh, record on you know, native native uh, humans and how they lived very healthy lives uh, as carnivores as well. And then making, uh, you know, and various chapters, you know, along those lines, just making this argument. But but then the, the, the overarching theme being, you know, making the argument that the the so-called chronic diseases that we treat as a mainstay in medicine now you know, the heart disease, diabetes, even most cancers and you know, certainly obesity. Yeah, that these these are not diseases per se, but toxicities and malnutrition. So toxic buildup of species inappropriate diet and a lack of species specific nutrition. So too much plants, not enough meat. And I think that that I can make a very strong case for that. And um, that and if we remove these toxic agents, that these diseases go away and you know and that that's sort of proof positive that this is that this is a, a poisoning toxicity model as opposed to a disease model right because you you have this this uh you know this uh stimulus and you're getting this response you take away the stimulus and the response goes away that's pretty straightforward or you know malnutrition right you know if you're you're not developing properly and you're uh, you know, your kids could develop autism, like say they don't have, if they have a carnitine deficiency and their brain just won't develop properly, that's, that's, you know, uh, malnourishment. They're not getting carnitine from meat and they're, and they're not making enough of it. Most people make enough of it. Not everyone does. And if you're not getting it from meat, then your brain's not going to develop properly. You're going to get a, a, a specific form of autism. But even as we age, our brains are made out of, of fat and, mm -hmm. You know, and and if we're not eating fat and cholesterol, we're not going to be building and maintaining our brain, and it's going to sort of decay, and we're just going to get, you know, uh, age-related atrophy of our brain, and we're going to develop Alzheimer's and dementia and have other problems. So these are things that are they're ultimately preventable uh, by either omitting these toxic elements um, or you know providing the proper nutrition for our body. And so that that's the main theme of that book, is is just making that argument and trying to make people aware that they can, they can really take control of their own health and, and their lives going forward. Sharing the conversation of your success, which ultimately, because uh, 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 Ken talks about this, Ken Berry, Dr. Berry, and many others, because so long as a physician, uh, do as I say, not as I do, is part of the challenge in life, right? Uh, mm. And so uh, it used to be that we'd be doing this, or, you know, we'd be doing this, and and if you think of the world, uh, I was down in Sarasota, you know, there's a band playing, it's got Budweiser, uh, it, you know, or whatever, you know, it's sort of inviting everyone into the amusement park, but recognizing that we all have to really be the strong willed ones through the coaching and cheerleading of people like yourself, uh, that, you know, is so, is so critical uh, in this in this amazing amazing world of life, are you going to be giving any talks in the coming uh, months or year? Or where can people continue to go visit you and find you with the, your website and and uh, you know people still like to meet people. We're we're you know this is nice, but where can we go to really see a live human being share the yeah. conversation ideas? Yeah, so I'll be I'll actually be speaking at uh, KetoCon in Austin uh, this July. So it'll be like July 8th, 9th, and 10th. So I'll be on the main stage of one of the, the keynote uh, talks, uh, I believe on the Friday, um, if I'm not mistaken. My, I think it's the Friday, if not the Saturday. But then also we'll be on a, a special carnivore panel on that Sunday 
as well. So I'll be able to be up there twice and then I'll, you know, obviously be around and, and, and watching other talks and, and meeting people as we go. And then, um, I'll be speaking at low carb down under in, um, uh, gold coast in Queensland in Australia. And that's, that's going to be coming up. It hasn't been, you know, officially, uh, announced yet, but it should be going on later in the year, probably in October. And so that will be, um, another one I'll be speaking at as well. And then they're going to try to do another low carb down under here, more locally here in, in Western Australia around Perth as well. So I'll be doing that. And then, you know, obviously I, 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 I put out sort of two to three videos a week on my YouTube channel and, uh, and, and the audio version on my podcast as well. And, and, uh, you know, we, we have these low carb, what is low carb? Yeah. Uh, what is LCHF? What, yeah. What, what, and how do we share that in a world that like isn't going to go like like glassy eyed and like what the heck is that, right? Yeah, I think I think it's um it's it's more of a terminology like when, because you know people would get scared off by you know, keto ketosis ketogenic because they they associate that with with ketoacidosis and which of course it's it's you know worlds apart. It's not the same thing. It just just shares uh, you know part of a, part of the same word, but. You know, so I think that that uh, is a way of of saying ketogenic diet with that, without using that terminology. And uh, you know, so like um, you know, Vinny Tatorich, you know, he does the you know the no no grains, no sugar, NSNGS, so no sugar, no grains. That's his that's his sort of thing. But what he what he said that he came up with that because. What he was saying was was ketogenic, but people were very much against ketogenic because they thought that meant ketoacidosis. So he said, "Okay, how can I say the same thing without scaring people?" And so he came up with that. So I think I think there's just the low carb, high fat uh, ideas is similar to that. But also I think it's a bit more specific because you can be on a ketogenic diet and and all that is is the lack of carbohydrates. So you could just be eating anything else. Really, it doesn't mean you're eating meat. Doesn't mean you're eating enough fat either. Uh, it just means that you're not eating carbohydrates. But so a low carb, high fat diet is, is really telling you that you you don't want the carbs and you and you want, but fat is good and you want to eat the fat as well. What about uh, how do you discuss and what's your thoughts on on you know how many meals a day, you know fasting, uh, and and what's your how do you have that conversation and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I don't I don't think that you. Uh, we, well, we necessarily need to fast. I think you you automatically will eat less, uh, but I don't I don't really consider that fasting. I, I think that people should just eat when they're hungry and eat to satiation. So, you know, because our hunger signals change very dramatically on a carnivore diet or even a ketogenic diet, um, just because your your signaling um, your hunger signals change dramatically, uh, and you can actually listen to them, so they actually sound different. But when you go by taste, if it tastes good, that means your body wants those nutrients. And so it'll, they'll actually stop tasting good. So I, I'd say just keep eating when meat tastes good, just eat it and keep eating until it stops tasting good and you stop enjoying it. And then, you know, maybe try eating, you know, a couple times a day just to make sure that your body's not asking for more. Um, because you're eating high density nutrition and you're eating to satiation, so you're filling up all the way, you, you're just going to eat less often. You're not going to eat, need to eat as much or as often. And so I, I find that I tend to eat, you know, usually once a day, sometimes twice a day, especially if I'm working out a lot and then my body wants more nutrition and I can't just eat as much as my body wants in one sitting. Um, and so I'll be, my body will ask for, for, for food more than once a day, but I don't, I don't specifically deprive myself of nutrition when my body's asking for it. And that's what I can, I think fasting is, is when you're hungry and you want to eat, but you're saying, no, I'm not going to eat because I'm fasting until this point. So I don't, I don't do that unless I have to, because I'm stuck at work and I can't eat. Um, but you know, I do tend to eat, you know, but people will say this, like, oh no, actually you're only eating, eating in this four hour window, or maybe you're eating just, you know, once a day or something like that. So you are fasting. I'm like, well, not really, because I'm not depriving myself of food. I'm not stopping myself from eating when I'm hungry. I eat when I'm hungry. And just because of how I eat, it tends to be once a day, sometimes twice a day. We have all these labels that most of the time I just go like, I don't know what the heck that means anyway. Uh, but, you know, if you're eating a high carb diet, your belly is full of carbs digesting 
always. Mm -hmm. And so that's the biggest, the most amazing thing to the story is that the bucket, the uh, stomach to the rectum, as long as it has carbohydrates inside of it, it's either fermenting or digesting and extracting the sugars, uh, what little protein is in a plant, what little fats are in a plant, uh, but it's also getting the the uh, plant antigens and the phytochemicals, which are basically, that's why this, this term fasting, my bet is, again, if we ate once a week, you know, a, a thousands of years ago, we're lucky to do that, that is fasting. Uh, but ultimately, because our healthy lifestyle, um, I eat healthy, organic, clean, which are words that I don't even know what they mean anymore. It's a very confusing, confusing sense. But, but when, when, when I saw Sarah Hallberg died of lung cancer, and she was a healthy person, yeah. exercised, ate healthy, and my best friend Dave died of cancer at 52, I now realize that what you're saying is, is the most important thing is that plants are the poison. Yeah. And meat uh, and, and fatty meat is, is, is really it. What's your, what's your daily, what, what is it you eat? What is it you cook for your girlfriend or your girlfriend cooks for you? Uh, so what can we inspire people to eat like uh, Dr. Chafee? Yeah. Um, you know, something like, you know, 98, 99% of what I eat is, is beef and usually steak. So, you know, ribeye is, was always my go-to, but like it's literally doubled in price over the past year here in Australia. So it's like, okay, screw that. So I'm just getting New York's now, which are, which are great. And those are still they're literally half the price of the, of the ribeyes here. Now it's, it's absolutely insane. So I just do that or I get briskets and, um, chuck steaks, you know, any, anything, anything you want really. But I, I like beef. I really like beef. And, and most of the time I'll do New York's. And so I'll get, I'll get like a whole strip loin or I get like a whole case of them from Costco, which you'll get a number of these things in the case. And I'll keep those in the fridge for a while actually and so i'll actually wet agent when in the in the cryovac packs uh if you leave them in there in the refrigerator that's wet aging them so a lot of these these you know very nice uh restaurants they'll wet age and then dry age so that's wet aging just leaving them in the cryovac uh pack it's, it's pretty easy so I'll, I'll just get a lot of these things in bulk and i'll throw them in there because they're just wet aging so it, i actually want them to sit there for a while because they're actually getting better as, as they age and then i'll open them up and i'll cut them up into steaks and then I'll, I'll uh, salt them just to, just as much salt as I would want on a steak. So that that varies with different people. And I'll put them up on drying racks and I'll just put those in the refrigerator as well. And the salt will soak in and dry out the meat a bit. And it just it just concentrates the flavor a little more, dries it out a bit. And, and it browns a lot better, it cooks a lot nicer. And it just, just it really improves the flavor. That was that was a trick that I learned from Alton Brown, who's like a you know celebrity chef. He's written a bunch of books. He's a very interesting guy because he'll actually talk about like the chemistry of cooking and what different chemical reactions are happening with you know between these different foods and why that changes the flavor and these sorts of things. So it's actually kind of interesting uh, to to watch him as well. And so that that was a trick that he did. And since I started doing that, it's like it was just a game changer for me. I do that for all meat, you know, fish, chicken, anything. I just I bought a couple ducks. From, do uh, do uh, wet age and dry age your lettuce by chance? Well, you dry <laughs> aging and dry aging lettuce, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. the wet age and dry age become putrid. Yes. Yeah. Meat becomes better. If yeah. that is like a simple answer to the universe, I don't know what is, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, everyone, everyone vilifies meat. They say, oh my God, it can go bad and all these sorts of things. It's like, how often have you seen, you know, uh, you know, lettuce keep its shape or, you know, spinach, you know, it just tr it turns to mush right away. Uh, there's a big, there's a big vegan push in Australia right now, especially in the schools. And there's a lot of schools that are, that are mandatory vegan. Like you are, you are not allowed to spend meat with your child, uh, uh, for lunch. And, um, and then, then other ones, you know, that aren't that way, you, you have to send a, a certain amount of fruits and vegetables with them or they will, they will send the kid home. Uh, and which is, which is a bit intrusive, I think. And, you know, and then there's like these ad campaigns going like, oh, you know, don't just, just be careful parents. Like, you know, don't send your kid to school with, you know, with meat in their lunch because, you know, ugh, it's not going to be in the refrigerator and it'd be like, you know, hours until lunch. And it could just, it could just go rotten. I was like, well, it never has before in the history of humanity. So why the hell is it going to start now? I you think know? in New York, I heard you can't send your child with whole milk. Uh, really? you know, 
sort of yeah. everything is a low fat, yeah. uh, which is trying to kill us all in, in yeah. one way or another. And I always say that's the masters. The masters who eat the Wagyu A5 steak are feeding the mass the masses mush. So mush yeah. keeps us meek. And, yeah. and, you know, that's the amazing, crazy story to this. Is yeah. it not? I'm sure, I'm sure chocolate milk is just fine, though, isn't it? As opposed to whole milk. You know, well, it's like... Yeah. I, I said, I'm sure that chocolate milk is probably just fine, though, but they have a problem with whole milk, you know, so they want low fat, high sugar, you know, and. Uh, so how do you do you treat yourself or your 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 partner? Do you guys get a, a dessert like ever? Where, where do you um, fall on that in, in just sort of the basics? Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, you know, the steak is my treat, you know, like I, I absolutely love every single one of those things. And, you know, when I, when I finish eating that, you know, I eat until I'm satisfied and I, I keep eating. It's, it's lobster. It doesn't give it very Not clear I don't know why, but it was lobster burger and uh, blue cheese and butter it was my lunch oh, my. yesterday. I mean, that was oh, my dessert. Yeah. Yeah, ab exactly. Yeah. You know, it's just like, you know, that that is my treat. You know, I, I said to my dad once, um, you know, that, that doing this, it just feels like it's my birthday every day, you know, because on your birthday, you get like the meal that you want. Like there's just the, the like the thing that you want. That's just like your favorite thing. And there's no guilt. There's no uh, there's no trouble. You just like you get what you want. It's your birthday. Treat yourself. Well, every time I had that special birthday meal, it was always like, you know, just a big ass steak with like, you know, like, you know, butter, maybe like a, you know, lobster tail on the side or some prawns or something like that. But it, it was always, it was always centered around a steak and meat in general. And so now every single day I'm, I'm making an absolutely amazing, you know, 30 day wet age, you know, 15 day dry aged, uh, you know, steak. And it's just incredible every single time. And it's just like, it's just like every day is my birthday because I, every day I'm having my birthday steak. So yeah, no, I don't, I don't ever feel like I'm missing out on treats or anything like that. So I make an ice cream and I, I, I but a really interesting way to do it is it's cream, eggs, add butter, salted, sweet butter. Remember sweet butter is just, is butter. Uh, but it has a sweet taste to it. So, uh, and, and I know, so I eat those steaks and, and uh, it just, it has a sweetness to it because ultimately I didn't know this, but the majority of sugars are actually not sweet tasting. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and most people don't realize that, 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 you know, get back to that sweet apple. Well, a week before that, it wasn't sweet. Right. And, mm. and then a week later, it, it's like rotten. Right. And it'll kill you. And, yeah. and, you know, that's the kind of the, uh, the part of this. Do you have, uh, uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, Alton Brown. Do you have any other favorite uh, carnivore uh, cooking uh, masters to, hear, to share their methods of cooking? There was, um, you know, my mom loves cooking and she, she's a fantastic cook. I mean, she, she's absolutely brilliant at it. And she, you know, she loves reading. She loves books in general. And, and she loves cooking. And so naturally she has a lot of books on cooking. She literally has over 500 cookbooks and she has read and used all of them. And so, you know, the, and this was something that when she went carnivore, uh, when she, my dad went carnivore, this was, this was quite hard for her because she was just like, I, I'm not going to get to do any of these really nice things. And so that was really hard for her. But then she actually started, you know, finding people that, you know, cook with fire and cook meat and do all these, these different sorts of recipes in different ways with me. And so she got started being able to, you know, focus her interests on that. Um, I can't remember the guy's name, but he is an Argentinian chef and he does these pretty amazing cooks where they'll take an entire cow and it'll be split up and it'll be up on like a, a big rack and sort of tipped over at 30 degrees and it'll have a fire built up underneath it and it will cook for 24 hours and it'll just cook like that for 24 hours. And, it, and it's just, and it comes out just, perfect and amazing and juicy. And I've seen the finished results of this and it just, it's mouthwatering just watching this. And so, you know, and this guy did one, I saw pictures of it online where he had a hundred cows cooking at the same time. And so it was like, I don't know what army he was feeding, but like, it was like, it was an impressive sight. They had all of these things cooking at the same time as going around tending all these fires. So, so things like that. Um, my mom has found me a few cookbooks that are they're very very meat centric and meat based, 
And, um, you know, for, for me, I, you know, I, I do tend to keep it quite simple, you know, because I'm not using a lot of seasonings or anything, you know, I'll do roasts, I'll do briskets. I like smoking things and, and this, the, the steaks that I do, those, those just turn out so well that like, I don't, I don't feel that, you know, anything needs to be improved upon with those. Um, you know, I just, I got some, some ducks from Costco as well. It's same thing, salted them, let them rest for a couple of days and then just roasted them. And they were just absolutely amazing as well. So it works for everything. How do you capture the fat from the, uh, the meat that you're, you're, you're cooking? Cause I, mm. I know for myself that I always, I actually cook my ribeye in a pan under the broiler with butter mm. and salt on it. And, and I usually cut it up so that it, it really browns. I mean, you know, really, I like black and blue and do it that way. And, and uh, but it captures the fat, which is kind of part of the proper barbecuing. It loses yeah. a lot of fat. Do you have any secrets to your fat, uh, uh, saving fat? Like, that's sure. your, yeah. Save fat, right? Yeah. Yeah. Fat conservationists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I often cook in a pan you know, for just that reason, you know, and, and that'll keep that in there. And, you know, I like searing it because, you know, because I, I, I sort of cut my steaks up uh, in, into what I think is going to be like a, a sort of a one or two steaks per day sort of thing. So I'll have like a big fat steak, you know, like a three inch thick steak. So I'll have to sear the sides as well, obviously. So you'll have like a bit of, bit of, uh, you know, like lard or tallow in the pan and then I'll sort of sear on each side and, you know, some of the, the fat will render out as well. And then I'll just, yeah, sort of like cook it. If it's, you know, sort of room temperature, cook it sort of three minutes on each side and that'll give it, you know, like a good sort of rare, um, but good sear uh as well so it has like a really nice sort of crust crispy crust because then you know because i've dried it a bit it has this almost like a like a crispy crunchy shell on the outside and it's it's, it's amazing it's absolutely amazing it's almost like it's been deep fried and it's just like this crunchy outside so you don't cut that i know a lot of people that dry age in these large dry age rooms will tend to cut the outer layers uh yeah. what's your thoughts on on that uh mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so if you're doing like a proper dry edge, if you're if you're dry edging the whole loin, yeah, that that's something you, you probably have to do. So I do it sort of differently. I, I think people call it like a dry brining, where where you uh -huh. just salt it, leave it out there. So so it doesn't rot. Essentially, just, brining it, br brine is that, that you said a dry brine. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So so you know you salt it and then it dries it out. So you know it, it won't go bad. It's not it's not growing bacteria. You know the worst that'll happen it'll it'll turn into you know beef jerky. Which is, which is great. I love beef jerky. So there's like there's no no harm done. Um, but yeah, so you, you don't need to you don't need to trim any of it off. If it's in there for like a big you know big thick one, I've even had it for up to two weeks, and it still tastes outstanding. But it's just sort of a, a little more dry than maybe you would want. And uh, but that's it. You know, it, it doesn't it doesn't go bad. And um, you know, so but it also gives that really nice crispy crust as well and then you just you take the fat off the pan then you just pour it back on on the steak when you get it on your plate now your time is very valuable uh, and we're having a good time are you okay for going a little bit longer and you just yeah. kind of go like this are you got a uh, couple of quick questions were mm -hmm. i've got uh, i've got instagram on dr kilt's uh md uh, uh sort of taking this but we got youtube and facebook here uh, Eleanor asks about hydration. We've got a couple of questions. Let me get to those and ask uh, uh, for Dr. Chapey. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, hydration? How much water uh, are you drinking a day and what should you be drinking? Yeah, well, I, 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 I'm a big fan of water. I know some people um, in the carnivore space, they think, so, well, maybe you shouldn't, you shouldn't drink all that much water because, you know, it might, might suppress your hunger. You're not going to eat as much. I, I, I just feel better when I drink a lot of water. I've always noticed that throughout my athletic career, that if I drink a gallon of water, I feel good. If I drink two gallons of water, I feel incredible. And so that was just me, but that was also, you know, training and performing at a high, high level. Now I, I'm not exerting that much. So I, I probably don't need two gallons, but I definitely feel better when I have more than a gallon. So I'm, when I'm between like sort of four and six liters, I'm feeling much better. Sometimes it's, it's hard, you know, like if I'm, if I'm just at work and I don't really have access to water and it's just busy and I'm running around, maybe I'll only have 
you know, like, you know, leader or something like that during work. And then I'll try to pound down two or three leaders when I get home uh, to try and catch up. But I always feel better if I, if I have uh, more water and, and yeah, it is just water. I do try to eat um, or try not to drink water within uh, like an hour or so or two of uh, eating. So I'll try to have like a, like an empty stomach just because, you know, this is something like, you know, um, and people have said before, like, you know, um, that, that you can sort of water down your, your stomach acid. Maybe you don't, you're not going to digest things as well. I don't, I don't know one way or the other, but like, I just, you know, I just, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't sound completely unreasonable. So, you know, I try to do that as well. I mean, I drink a mineral water cause I like the taste of mineral and I love a carbonation personally. Um, it's interesting. I was, I was talking to a friend who got me Topo Chico, uh, water from Mexico. Interesting enough, it's 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 sold by or bought by Coca Cola, and I was commenting how it almost feels, and it's like a Coke, and and, yeah. and I said, like, you know, this is really interesting marketing in the world we're in today. Uh, you know, it's that that feel of something that you because I used to drink Coke like years ago, like all the time, and then I went to Diet Coke, and I don't recommend any of those things today. Uh, let's yeah. see. Um, uh, Anna Victoria, a 16-year-old cousin has epilepsy. Uh, as a neurosurgeon, have you seen a carnivore diet improve symptoms of epilepsy? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. You know, this is something that we, we've used as doctors for nearly 100 years. You know, it's still, it's still the practice of Johns Hopkins uh, to put people on a ketogenic diet uh, if they have epilepsy. I honestly think that it should be the absolute the first line of, uh, of uh, treatment for someone with with epilepsy. Uh, unfortunately, it's almost never used at all. I've, I've talked to so many people with with epilepsy and having different you know, you know, you know seizure um, uh, you know, issues with seizures. And, and I always sort of ask them, it's just like, you know, has your, has your neuro neurologist ever mentioned this? Whatever, like they've never even talked about it. They've never mentioned it. And and it, it really blows my mind because this is actually, you know, this was this is a well-known mainstay in the treatment of epilepsy and it has been for literally a century um, probably thousands of years if you think yeah. about it you know so what did i mean we didn't just learn this stuff 100 years ago none of this is new uh, yeah it's yeah ancient, yeah. right ancient yeah yeah and uh, but yeah and you know it, but yeah just a, just a ketogenic diet has been used therapeutically uh, for for epilepsy and migraines for for literally a hundred years, and, and, and I know, you might not know that keto is a high fat, and, and really what we're talking about is high animal fat. Uh, yeah, I mean that's the carnivore side of things. It's high animal fat, uh, and 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 ultimately most 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 human diets have about twenty percent protein anyway. What, what's your thoughts on uh, 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 plant proteins? No, they're not, they're not very good. I think I think it's I think it's it's a bit it's very misleading. And so you know you know a protein is not a protein is not a protein, you know. And so when when you're getting yeah, and and if you're getting um, you know it, labels are very misleading and just flat out fraudulent, really, because when you look at you look at the amount of protein that's in in plants like wheat or whatever, you know that is not. A, it may not even be protein because they calculate things by crude nitrogen. So they just calculate the amount of nitrogen that's in something. Well, all of that nitrogen may not be uh, as part, part of protein. They just assume it is, but that's not necessarily the case. And then, you know, even if it has 30 grams of protein in it, it like let's say if it's coming from wheat, well, 80% of the protein in wheat is uh, gluten. Gluten is not usable as protein by your body, you, you cannot use that as protein. So 80% of that is, is out the window anyway. So there's only, you know, out of 30 grams of wheat protein, there's really only six that are maybe going to be usable, you know? So it, it's, it's a very different thing. And so, you know, the bioavailability of these things, you know, the crude nitrogen versus true protein, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just very, very, very misleading. And also there are a lot of things in plants that, that, uh, uh, block your your uh, um, your enzymes from your pancreas to break down proteins and absorb them in the first place or you know to block their absorption so even if you have usable proteins it will prevent your body from even absorbing them and so when you're actually eating you know animal-based proteins 
and you're eating, you know, these different, you know, plants and vegetables that can actually stop your body from breaking down animal proteins and absorbing them as well. So, you know, anything, anything to do with plants and protein is, is going to be a bad I combination. Think, I think viruses are made out of, 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 of glycoproteins. So next right. they'll be packaging uh, uh, coronavirus glycoproteins eliminating the gland and selling us a viral protein, like they're selling, trying to yeah. sell us, I think, a, a, a bug protein. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the next one. Uh, but we are we are easily manipulated by the masters who basically mm. eat a five wagyu steak because the masters know that that is the healthiest. And that's why meat, especially ribeye, is very expensive because yeah. it's, it's just another one of those. Barbara, Barbara uh, Schultz, thanks, Barbara, for being here today, asked about... Uh, pounds of meat that you eat and, and, and how do you sort of define how much you're eating? Yeah. So I, I don't, uh, I don't weigh my food. I don't count calories. I don't count macros. You know, I think that if you are eating what you're naturally supposed to eat, what you're biologically uh, designed to eat, that you can just listen to your body. And so, you know, if you need a calculator to figure out what to eat, you're probably eating the wrong thing. And so, you know, nature's natural. It just happens. And so I just listen to my body. Um, when I do that, if I'm just sort of doing my normal work and not, not exercising, I'll eat you roughly around two, two and a half pounds of meat a day. Very fatty meat though. I eat, I eat like 80% of my calories come from animal fat. Um, when I'm, when I'm working out a lot, my body just demands more because, and I just, and I stack on muscle very, very quickly when I listen to my body and eat appropriately. I, I still have to eat the requisite amount. And at that point I'll probably double that. So I eat, you know, four to five pounds of, of meat in a day if I'm if I'm lifting heavy and working out heavily. So it really just depends on my activity level. But on a normal day, just to maintain, you know, my, you know, six foot three, 230 pound frame, it, it's usually about, you know, two and a half pounds a day if I'm working out and I'm putting on a couple of pounds of muscle a week, which is a very normal thing for me. If I'm working out regularly, uh, it'll be like four to five pounds. Yeah. And I, I kind of uh, do the fist uh, uh, way. You know, I'm amazed how how I often cook more than I eat because, you know, our, our mm -hmm. eyes, are, you know, it's, certainly it's like, oh, and then, then we do it. And when I'm full, I just package it up and put it away and often yeah. have it as a snack the next day, two or three. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, the, a fistful is about right uh, that, that I found helpful in, in all of this. Uh, how do you, so, uh, Again, thanks to everyone for sharing. And Dr. Chafee, thank you very, very much for being here yeah. again today. Um, for people who are just kind of getting on board on carnivore, where should they go? How do they, like, you know, just keep on the journey and keep moving forward? Well, yeah, I, I think that, you know, just the main thing is, is just keep, you know, watching uh, channels like your, like yourself, you know, I, you know you know, and different videos, just try to learn as much about it as you can. You know, every, I think everyone's sort of done like some beginner videos. I've done, you know, how, you know Carnivore for Beginners. I know, uh, you know, Ken Berry has as well. I'm sure Sean Baker has, and, you know, you, know, you might have as well. Um, and so, you know, see all these sorts of things, try to arm yourself with information. There you I, go. I would really keep it simple. I mean, like you, you, yeah. you steak, I ribeye, and I, and I occasionally make my ice cream, but mostly it's just mm -hmm. that I, yeah. don't, I don't. It's that once in a while, but I'm in a different part of where I'm at. Uh, yeah. But but you know, I'm sorry. Keep on going. But it's no, finding yeah. this in this space. Yeah. yeah, and you know, and just and just sort of you know, learning as much as you can about it, and, and you know, being comfortable with that. And then when you you get going, just just recognize that you know you don't have to be perfect right out of the gate. You know, keep it simple. Just to sort of you know, focus on you know, just eating meat and, and not eating other things. And, you know, if you slip up and you, you have some pizza or some ice cream or God forbid a salad, you know, that, you know, you can just, you can just hop back on, you know, you're just like, Oh, I messed up. Okay, great. You just, just hop back on. You know, there's a lot of people that get, get discouraged or feel that they're just not allowed in the club. Uh, if they, if they eat rice one time, uh, when they've been carnivore, I have, I've had some friends on the rugby team, uh, they started doing carnivore and they were like, ah, I've never felt stronger. I never felt better. I just felt amazing. But then I went to my, you know, my, my mom's house for dinner over the weekend and, you know, had some rice. So I was like, I ate some rice. So I guess that's, I guess that's it. And they were so dejected. I was just like, you, know, you can just start back up again. Right. And he's like, oh, really? Like you really hadn't even thought of that, 
you know, and it's just like, yeah, just, just get going again. So it's okay to slip up. You know, we, we're all human. You know, we're going to mess we, up. We allow sinners into the, uh, yeah, into exactly. the house. And, yeah, and exactly. I always say that, listen, we're all humans on this journey and it, it's, we're, we're, we're bringing everyone in on the conversation and we want to support everyone and not like, Oh my God, you messed up and see you later. But it really needs to be, uh, we're all on the journey and support and positivity. And I always say faith is first and, and uh, you know, inspirations by watching Dr. Chafee and so many others. And, you know, anything that we fight always fights back. And I, I you know, that's why I don't do uh, uh, contact sports anymore mm -hmm. uh, because I, I got hurt too much. And this, uh, I, I, what it, so exercise and working out. Okay, I want to go carnivore, but I just want to sort of go for a walk in life and, and not work out. How would you uh, advise as a health and wellness uh, expert and coach? Yeah. Well, I think you know, the A number one important thing is, is the diet, you know, and everything else is a function of your diet. And, and you'll get a lot more out of, of your life and your activity. Uh, you know, if you're if you're on, you know, a, a, a true human diet and just eating meat and drinking water and you're going to feel great and you'll probably you'll probably actually want to go and do things physically because you'll just physically feel better. But you don't you don't have to. You know, I, I don't have time. I just I just physically don't have time to work out the way I want to. And so maybe I go to the gym once every few weeks now. Um, that's, you know, hard for me, you know, being you know someone who, who's played you know high level sports. Uh, since I, since I was 14, you know, I was, I was, I was training, you know, in a professional MMA gym, in a fighter's gym, uh, since I was my 14th birthday with, with UFC champions, champions and people going for the UFC championship. And so, you know, that, that's, that's weird to me to not be working out for six or eight hours a day. Uh, I don't, I don't have that time, you know, but I don't have six or eight hours a month to work out. Um, but you know, my physique is maintained and my health is maintained and even my strength and my athleticism is maintained, uh, because of this diet. And so when I do get to the gym, my, my weights don't actually change all that much. I don't, I don't go really go down. I'm, I'm not making huge gains or anything like that because I'm not going to the gym for, every, for a few weeks at a time, but you know, I'm not going backwards really. So do as you can do what time allows and do what you enjoy, you know, try to get outside, try to enjoy the sunshine, try to get out in the fresh air, enjoy the life, enjoy nature. You know, if you want to go on hikes, go for walks, whatever you enjoy, you know, but I think it, it really does start with the diet and then things will build up from there. What's your, th now I know this is probably hard in your, in your current business. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on naps and rest? Oh my God. I wish I could have, uh, I, yeah, I really wish I could nap like all the time. Uh, you know, sleep is so important and it's, you know, it's, it's really important for the brain as well. You know, there was, um, there's a, oh, gosh, what is he a professor of? There's like, you know, the neuropsychology or something like that. Anyway, he, he's a, he's a uh, professor at Berkeley and um, he, he wrote a book all about sleep and he, you know, he's a, he's a sleep expert and he, and he was saying that, if you get average less than six hours of sleep per night, you're six times more likely to develop Alzheimer's, you know? And you know, the way I think about this is that, you know, obviously when your neurons are firing, they're, they're getting damaged and our neurotransmitters, the, you know, when they break down, the breakdown products of our neurotransmitters are actually neurotoxic, you know? So they're actually, you know, they're actually toxic to the cells that, that have produced them and broken them down. And so if they're not turning off and they're not resting and, and they're not rebuilding or repairing, they're getting damaged and eventually they will die. And so if you're not getting enough sleep, these things are on too, too often. So they're getting damaged more and you're not, and you don't have as much time to repair them. So that's bad. But also, you know, if you're not getting enough fat, DHA, EPA, you know, cholesterol, all, you know, the very long chain fatty acids, like, you know, 20, 22 chain fatty acids that only exist in meat. And we don't really make ourselves. If we're not getting that from meat. You know, we're not we're not going to be able to get the building blocks up to our brain to, to rebuild them. So, you know, but we need both. Right. So you need to have enough fat. You need to have enough concrete for your, your workers to you know pour a foundation. And then you've got to, you know, have time for uh, for the workers to like be on the job site. You know, so you need to get enough sleep and you need to have have the building materials for them as well. So, yeah, sleep is very important. So I found on carnivore, I'm tired more. 
Oh, really? Now, okay, the, the reason is, is because when you're on the plants, so much of it is an upper. And we are meant to rest more. No other animal in the universe is going all day, all day, all day. It ain't happening. So I take one to three naps a day, 10 minutes each. Amazing. I go to bed early, get up early. I have more energy than ever. But I get, when I feel tired, I just take it and take that nap. Because I think it is, as you said, it's the brain resetting. It's the ATP rejuvenating. But a lot of it is because I don't eat the things that actually were the uppers mm -hmm. that is keeping us going and our force in our modern world that you got to go, 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 go in order to succeed and make money. And mo money is the misery of the world. And I would say that making with me, we make men, mommies and, and more masters in life. But, you know, I think you're right. Sleep and rest more, but you'll, you'll get plenty of it. And, you know, it's like even a five or 10 minute, uh, meditative moments, I think, are really valuable for, for all of us. So, uh, But Dr. Chafee, God bless you. Thank you so much for making an uh, hour plus uh, with Kilts. And uh, again, uh, what what's your website and, uh, and, and, and where do people find you? Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I uh, had, uh, had a great time as always. Um, so I'm, I, my website is uh, thecarnivorelife.com. It's it's sort of currently under construction, but that'll be that'll be up and going soon. Uh, my YouTube channel is just Anthony Chafee MD, and I have a lot of different videos on there. Probably around sixty videos now uh, with a range of different topics. Um, I have my Instagram page is is again Anthony Chafee MD. And I post a lot of things from YouTube. I also put sort of blog posts and, uh, and updates there with different messages and tips and advice uh, for, for diet and uh, exercise. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Facebook's just Anthony Chafee. Uh, Twitter's just Anthony.Chafee. I don't use that as much, but yeah, I, I am on there. And then, uh, uh, yeah, and that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, YouTube's the main one. And, oh, and then my, my podcast is... Uh, the plant free MD, and that's on any any podcast uh, uh, platform. This is socialized medicine at its very best, if you think about it, right? It's social yeah. media. It's taking it out of the hands of the experts, and and it's putting into the hands of of those that you know. We're, we're all responsible for our own health and wellness, and you know, my my goal in life is actually to share more of how we can learn from experts like Dr. Chafee. And all you need to do is Google it, and you'll find it. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we'll get, you know, it's like they want you to cook more, by the way, on uh, online. And so more mm -hmm. of that is better. So, again, God bless. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, Dr. Rob Kelts, and uh, keep, keep sharing your stories. Take care. Thanks.